Let me get these notes opened up here for us. Okay, uh, we are covering the westward expansion here, and we're looking at a time period from 1800 to 1860. So you may think, oh, something seemed to have happened around 1860. So in the early 1860s, you know, we have the beginning of the American Civil War. So it's no accident that this cuts off right before then. I mean, tensions were growing high in the early 1860s, so it kind of uh, delayed westward expansion for that reason. So let's take a look at this picture for just a minute. I think it's really kind of neat that it shows so much about westward expansion in one image. This is a picture, um, a painting actually, by John Gast called American Progress. And it was painted in about 1872. I'm gonna see if I can blow this up a little bit for you. So we can see a little bit more of this picture here as we talk about it. So in this painting, I want to point out a few things to you. First of all, we had this angelic creature here in the middle. She's obviously the focus of this painting. She's front and center, and all of the light focuses on her. So very clearly meant to be the focus of the painting. In her arms, she's carrying a book. Now, that might say Holy Bible, can't get that close to it to see. It could also be just a book. Either way, it is symbolic of knowledge, either taking knowledge in terms of education or knowledge in terms of religion into the West. So we have this very white figure, which represents, you know, European Americans who are now moving West. And the idea is that they're going to bring with them a lot of things and um, a lot of enlightenment for the West. That's another thing I wanna to talk to you about. So if we look here, when you look at the right side of the painting, it's already very light. The light is behind this angelic creature. And that's because that area has already been lit up. So she is actually taking light into the West. The idea here is this narrative that Americans will take with them the enlightenment. They'll lighten up these dark areas, the dark paganness of the West, the dark wildness of the West. And that's where religion and knowledge in general come in handy. So that book could really represent either of those. She is also holding a cable. If you can look close enough and see that she's actually stringing cable as she goes, and that cable would be for like the telegraph. Um, let's see, what else can we talk about here? Oh, something else that's really kind of neat about this painting is that if you look here, there's a group of Native Americans here and a group of pioneers here. So they seem to be peacefully coexisting, no problem. Now, these pioneers, they're just moving forward. They're not looking up because they feel like um, she is on their side. And according to this image, she is technically on their side of the image. She's a little more over them than over the other side, which would cover the Native Americans. They are looking up, this group is looking up in fear though. They're looking up like, oh, OMG, what is this happening? What is this happening to us? This is kind of weird. And they're awestruck and they're terrified, which gives a message. Right. I mean, when we talk about propaganda, a lot of times we think about certain things like uh, newsletters or signs or posters. But this is a painting that was sharing a message that was Americans will make the West better. And you won't have to worry about the Native Americans. We have these pioneers here who are clearly getting along with them already. And look, they're scared of Americans. They're scared of enlightenment. Well, so anyway, you can see how this uh, painter really kind of encapsulated the idea of manifest destiny. Manifest destiny is the idea that it is a God-given right to move into something. You know, this is, the Americans believed that this was their God-given right to take this land, that this land was theirs waiting for the taking. Didn't matter that there were other people in it already. So 
the Americans thought, well, we'll go educate those people. We'll change them to our religion and everything will be fine. And so that was westward expansion. Another thing I want to point out here, this, this bear is even afraid. So, you know, you don't have to worry about Native Americans or wild beasts because, you know, they're going to be afraid of you if you're an American and you're moving to the West. There's some other little things I want to point out here too. I think, um, you know, we talked about these pioneers. Here are some others who are farming. These are hunting. These are farming. And they've taken wild beasts and tamed them and they're using them to plow, which you know, shows that livestock can be um, harnessed here, can be used for farm labor, which is important in terms of agriculture. Over here, we also have a lot of wild buffalo roaming, which was um, to exemplify ample food, uh, ample power. If you can harness those buffalo, you know, also, they use buffalo for like different skins and that kind of thing, their hides. So, you know, there's a lot to look at in that regard, too. One of the other things, and the last thing we'll talk about here, as far as the images in this painting, that I like is that it really encapsulates all the travel options available at this particular time. So we have people walking on foot, which I guess is technically the earliest mode of travel. You know, if you're going to hoof it, if you're going to get somewhere. So we have people on foot. We have people on horseback back here. We have covered wagons. We have a stagecoach. We have steam engine trains, which is really pretty cool. And then back here, we even have ships. So we see all of that. We see that there's plenty of grass for these animals. There's plenty of water for these ships. There's track for these uh, trains, which means that, you know, communicating is not going to be an issue at all when you go to the West, or that's the narrative anyway. Something else, I wish I could zoom in a little bit closer, but on her head is a star. It's called the Star of Empire. Um, I got a phone call one day from a friend of mine who was doing some genealogy research, and she said, I need to know what the Star of Empire is. And I said, it's got to be the name of a train. I mean, because they named trains, things like that back then. And um, so, but what is the context of it in? Maybe that'll help us. And the context was that her relative came to Arkansas on the start of the empire. And I was like, it's got to be a train. So we looked everywhere, everywhere I knew to look for trains. Couldn't find it. But every Google search I did came back to this painting and it's because that star is known as the star of the empire. So, so the obituary my friend found that said her ancestor came to Arkansas on the star of the empire just meant that he left wherever he was in the east and moved to Arkansas as part of westward expansion. It used to be a big deal to go west of the Mississippi, and her ancestor did that. Okay. Uh, this is just a basic timeline. We're going to start around the early 1800s and go into 1860. So um, Lewis and Clark, we mentioned Lewis and Clark previously. Um, Lewis and Clark were hired by Thomas Jefferson to explore the Louisiana Purchase and to figure out, you know, what's where. <laughs> and they were also looking for the Northwest Passage. So um, we talk about Sacagawea too. Um, if you've heard the story of Sacagawea, you've probably heard her um, described as an important woman in history who was known for her contribution as an interpreter for Lewis and Clark. And that's true. I mean, it's not exactly untrue. Um, and just because it's not exactly untrue doesn't mean it's 100% absolutely true, though. The real story of Sacagawea is a little bit darker. She was the daughter of a Shoshone chief. And um, since he was a chief, we, you know, we kind of think of that as a king position, which would make her a princess. So kind of a Native American princess of sorts. And she was captured because she was seen as very important to that tribe since she was the chief's daughter. She was captured by a rival tribe and sold into slavery. A French-Canadian trapper named Charbonneau purchased her 
when she was just 12 years old and made her one of his wives. So at 12, she becomes the wife of a French Canadian trapper. Um, they lived among a couple of different tribes in the area that we now know as North Dakota. So they would have had knowledge of neighboring tribes' languages. So Charbonneau, as a longtime French Canadian trader, would have had that knowledge through his dealings with um, the Native Americans in the area. And his wife, as a Native American herself, would have had some knowledge of those regional languages. So they were important to Lewis and Clark for that reason. Now, normally we hear that she was the interpreter. It was actually Charbonneau, her husband, who was hired to be the interpreter. But she was an important part of that trip for a different reason. Now, she did interpret. She did help along the way. Um, but she's not the one who made the money for it. Not that that matters today, but just thought, thought I'd throw that in there. Um, she was pregnant when they left for the trip. So um, her importance to the trip was actually to kind of soften the image of what Native Americans might have seen as they see strangers roll up the shores in these boats or on these horses, whatever they're traveling in at this time. And up, so much of it was water travel. But um, the idea that a pregnant woman makes the whole bunch seem a lot less threatening. So she had that role to play. She actually gave birth on the expedition. It was February, 1805. In addition to you know, having a baby, on the uh, expedition, she also, you know, foraged. She found edible plants and nuts and fruits and helped kind of maintain the food for the um, crew. Uh, let's see. Oh, another important thing about her during this time. Through this expedition, she was actually able to see her long lost brother who had moved up to chief of the tribe himself. So she was able to make that reconnection with her brother along the way. And it was this brother of hers who got horses for them to help them get through the Rocky Mountains. So the Rocky Mountain stretch was treacherous. So um, Clark grows very fond of this baby boy that she has on the expedition. And a while after the expedition is over, Charbonneau decides to take the little boy to go visit Clark. And um, he goes home without a baby boy. He decided to leave him with Clark. Clark said he would raise him and give him um, a good American education. So he left the boy with Clark. A few years later, about three years later, actually, Sacagawea gives birth again, this time to a daughter, and she died shortly after the daughter's birth. So uh, Charbonneau did the thing that he did before. He took that baby to Clark, and Clark was happy to take the baby and raise her as well. So anyway, that's something we don't really think about or talk about when we talk about Sacagawea. So I wanted you to be sure to hear her story. Also, We've been talking about Charbonneau being a trapper, so he was trapping animals for furs and pelts. So I just thought I would include a few images here to show you some of the things that these furs were used for. Um, also, fur trapping is still a thing. We have trappers in Arkansas. Uh, it's not nearly as um, viable as far as... Um, a big trade like it used to be in our area anyway. But in 2019, I mean, there was enough fur trading going on that California felt like they should make a law called the Wildlife Protection Act of 2019 in order to ban certain trading of um, trapping of gray fox, coyote, beaver, badger, and mink. And it made it illegal to sell their pelts. So let's talk about a few little different things here in terms of um, the Adams Onus Treaty. Treaty. All right. So the Adams Onus Treaty is 
indicated here. Let me see if I can make, nope, yep, yeah, so I can't make that bigger. Okay, so we can see in this map that the United States, before it's technically like we know it today, has input from several countries. Uh, we have a large amount of Spanish territory through here. This is before we um, start carving that out. We also have U.S. territory here. We have the United States themselves here, the U.S. territory here, and um, Spanish territory or Spanish territory here. This is the uh, territory that Spain cedes to the U.S. a little bit later. Um, let's look down here. This red line indicates the border that is decided by the Adams Onus Treaty in order to um, establish this border between the United States and Spanish territory. And I just want to call your attention up here too to this area that is now like the area of Washington, Oregon up here uh, that's jointly occupied and jointly owned at this particular point in time by the United States and Great Britain. I thought that was kind of interesting because we kind of overlook that one little aspect. You know, usually we think of the British all along the East Coast, but we had this, this one little section in the West that is co-owned by the U.S. and Great Britain. We'll talk about that more in just a minute. The Missouri Compromise is very important in this time period. Um, so as the nation grew, some people wanted to continue slavery and some people did not. The Missouri Compromise was an attempt to abolish slavery. Um, Another consideration was maintaining the balance of power in Congress so that slave states or these abolitionist states that neither would have more power than the other. They wanted it to kind of be equal. Um, so the Missouri Compromise determined that Missouri would be admitted as a slave state, but that Maine would be admitted at the same time as a free state. So this kind of develops the idea that if a slave state joins, a free state must join, or vice versa. If a free state joins the union, then a slave state must join the union. Um, this area here, and this is Missouri, and this is the Missouri Compromise Line, the border basically between Arkansas and Missouri today um, is the 3630 parallel that sets this border. Now, the thing is, the Missouri Compromise said that after Missouri, no other states below the, or no other states above that line could be admitted as slave states. So it doesn't look, it's not easy to remember that way for sure. If someone had thought we'd have to remember that all these years later, maybe they would have done it differently. But um, so Missouri was admitted as a slave state. And from then on, all slave states had to be south of this line. Um, Maine, of course, was a free state. So there's that. And uh, we'll continue talking about the Missouri Compromise, too, as we continue talking a little more about slavery and such. Uh, in the early 1830s, all the lands east of the Mississippi River had already been settled and admitted to the Union as states. The land west of the river, although um, had not yet, and so I love how someone drew an eagle to show this territory. Anyway, that's why I put it there. Just, just kind of for an interesting look at how they took the map that we saw back here and created that into something like this. Anyway, the eagle has been long associated with freedom for our country. Canadians think that eagles are just like dirt birds. So, you know, anyway, it's an American thing. All right, this map is, um, let me see. Oh, can't, yes, I can make it closer. There we go. This map shows the extent of land grants that were made by Mexico to get American settlers to come settle um, area that we now know as Texas. 
Since the U.S. recognized Spain, uh, Spain's sovereignty of Texas, Mexico actually welcomed American settlers by giving them land grants. So they're allowing immigration of Americans into Texas. So um, they get these Americans get land grants for coming in to this area in order to settle it. The problem with this is that most of these grants were all on the eastern side of the state. Well, what we now know as a state. And the western section was um, filled with Native Americans who were very hostile. So as the eastern side of these land grants start to fill up, Mexico wants more to settle in the West. And they're like, no, no, we're not going to go there. We're going to cluster all together. So when you put people clustering all together, you get this continued cultural exchange between people who are already similar. So they, they start to bond. That's where I'm going with that. They start to bond. Um, Mexico recruited impresarios who are people who bring settlers to a region in exchange for a land grant so let's say someone offers me a land grant to bring people in to settle and I bring all of you so that's what an impresario is doing um the so we had these impresarios moving into the Texas area uh, Moses Austin is one of them he wanted to take 300 Americans into Texas and um, Spain agreed as long as all of these Americans converted to Roman Catholicism, which was important part of uh, Spanish and Mexican history in terms of religion. So they agreed. After his death, Moses Austin's, Moses Austin's son, Stephen, carried out his father's wish. And Stevens um, took his father's land grant and settled the area that we now know as Austin, Texas. There were other people in these regions as well. They were known as Tejanos. These are Mexican people who live in the region. So they are people from Mexico, Mexico living in these land grant regions that are um, given to the Americans. Soon, such land grants meant that um, American immigrants outnumbered the Tejanos, okay? So we have so many Americans moving in and fewer Tejanos. Um, the Americans, because, you know, they do all cluster together in the eastern part of that region, they want to take over the land. Sorry, I'm having to adjust a little bit. They wanted to take over the land, and they were really upset about some things that the Mexican government did. So first of all, the Americans don't like the Texas slash Mexico legal system. You know, they don't have any representation in it. So they don't like that. Um, they also get really mad when Mexico ends slavery in 1829. They no longer allow slavery in that region. A lot of the people who took those land grants were from the South and they had slaves. And if you're going into a Wild West kind of area, it needs a lot of work. And if you don't want to do that work, you know, you wanted your slaves to do the work. So a lot of those Southern Americans who became immigrants into Texas were really mad about the end of slavery. So it got so bad and the Americans were just complaining so much. The American immigrants were complaining so much that in 1830, Mexico said, we're done here. We're not allowing U.S. immigration anymore. And they increased their military presence at the border. So just want to make sure you heard that. So there were so many Americans going into Mexican territory, Texas, that they increased their border control. Anyway, um, the settlers continued to illegally cross the border. So Mexico has a problem. They have too many Americans crossing into their territory. Uh, this is a portrait of General Santa Ana, uh, who was the Mexican president at the time of all of this. Um, in 1833, a group of American settlers met 
because they wanted to write a constitution for an independent Texas. By golly, they want to be separate from Mexico at this point. They want Santa Ana to get rid of their taxes. They want to allow immigration from the United States into Texas again. They want better protection from the Native American tribes. And they want more land grants. Want, 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 want. So Santa Ana agrees to everything except independence. And he reinstates immigration to the uh, United States citizens who want to come into Texas in 1835. Now, later he reverses his course on all those promises, but he, you know, he gives them what they want, most of what they want for a little while. Um, this is part of the Texas Revolution. Um, you know, they, the American Texans meet in March 1836 and declare independence from Mexico. And to put things into perspective, 1836 is when Arkansas joins the Union. So Texas is fighting for its independence from Mexico at this time. Uh, the Tejanos, the Mexican people who live in the Texas area, have been listening to the Americans and they're on board with it. They like, hey, we like this whole democracy thing you're talking about. And also we like some of these reforms you're talking about. What is this, you know, representative voice in government? We're cool with that. So the Americans had the Tejano support at this particular time. And um, they kind of, they kind of compromised with some things and decided that uh, slavery would not be permitted in this new Texas that they created. So they've got Tejano support and an end to slavery in this new Texas territory as they begin fighting for their freedom. You guys have heard of the Alamo. So this is uh, an image depicting the um, Alamo complex. Um, I've included this link here for you. I'm not going to click it here because I'm on um, hosting this on YouTube. So my channel will, or my video will be taken down if I include somebody else's video within it. So uh, there it is. I'll include a link for you too. It's a Johnny Cash version of a song called Remember the Alamo. And it just kind of goes to show how folklore kind of gets twisted around and um, sticks with us, especially when you attach it to a catchy-ish tune. So um some American troops took refuge at the Alamo. Um, there were 200 Americans against 4,000 Mexicans there. Um, the Americans fought fearlessly, but um, most were killed. Very few survived. Uh, the Texas forces under Sam Houston gathered recruits along their way to um, continued the fight and their battle cry was remember the Alamo. Basically, remember how hard these 200 people fought against 4,000. You know, that was kind of the idea. Um, Santa Ana signed a peace treaty to end the war, to recognize an independent Texas, and he set the Rio Grande as the southern border, but the Mexican Congress removed Santa Ana from office so the Congress refused to recognize the peace treaty. So, you know, at this particular point, the Rio Grande is set as the border, but, you know, there's, Congress isn't recognizing it. So there's a problem still. Um, in September, 1836, Sam Houston is elected the president of Texas. You heard that right, the president, because at this point, uh, Texas is its own country. It's, made up largely of Americans, but they are in Mexican territory that they have taken for themselves and declared, you know, their independence. So he is president of an independent Texas. And the Texans rather quickly vote to annex into the United States, you know, to join the Union. But the United States sees a bigger problem with that. Uh, first of all, it would upset the Missouri Compromise because um, remember that border, uh, 
the top, the upper Arkansas border between Arkansas and Missouri said that everything below that line would be a slave state. So that would mean Texas would have to be a slave state and they have decided to be a free state. So that would be an issue. The bigger problem here is that it would upset relations between the United States and Mexico. And so the U.S. was not ready to kind of poke that bear. So for the time, Texas becomes the independent Lone Star Republic. It got recognition early on from France and Great Britain and Belgium and Netherlands. And all of those were important to provide protection from Mexico. The United States held off, however. They did not officially recognize Texas until March 1837, about a year later. And um, as luck would have it for the uh, Tejanos, Texas pushed them out. So they had the support of the, te the Tejanos. Tejanos fought alongside them in the war, and uh, they pushed them out. And they also start pushing out the Native Americans. Okay. Let's move forward here. Okay. I mentioned the Oregon Territory already here. Um, in the area that we have the um, territory that is owned, co-owned by Great Britain and the United States. So we won't go over this. Okay. Oregon wanted, or the U.S. wanted Oregon for Pacific Northwest Post and for trade with Asia. Polk was president at the time when Queen Victoria agreed to set the British boundary at the 49th parallel, which is the current border between the United States and Canada. Polk was willing to use force for westward expansion, including California. So he was ready to set out to capture northern Mexico, which would be about the area that we now call New Mexico. Also Mexico City, what we now know as California. And um, it was the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo that set the Rio Grande as the U.S.-Mexico border and developed California, New Mexico, Nevada, Utah, and Colorado as states. In 1845, when Texas finally gets to join the United States, when they get to join the Union, Mexico insisted that the U.S. only had right to the territory um, of this little river right here. And so you can see this is where we wanted the line to be, and this is where they said the line was. So that was an argument that had to be settled as well. Um, the anti-Catholic sentiment played an important role in the Mexican-American War. Uh, the American public generally regarded Roman Catholics uh, as cowardly. And um, that's why um, it was... That's a, it's funny because, I mean, this anti-Catholic sentiment has continued for a long time in our country. And it's funny to me because it's like the oldest religion, the oldest Christian religion. Um, but it's kind of, it developed a lot of stereotypes here. We see this um, person who is a, a drunken priest or something like that. So Anyway, uh, Catholicism was associated with Mexico, as we talked about earlier, how Mexico said, sure, we'll you know, let you guys come here with land grants, but you got to be Catholic, you know. So uh, that's why I think there was a lot of early on disdain for the Roman Catholic people. And this is just um, an image of when an image this is a painting of um, General Winfield Scott going into Mexico City on a white horse. Anyway, uh, you'll have a video about that, so I'll leave that for it. The gold rush starts. You've heard of the 49ers. So the 49ers were people who were rushing for gold in 1849. 
So the discovery of gold was the end of 1848. So the big push, the big rush, if you will, was 1849. Lots of people went there for quick riches, including people from China who were um, largely discriminated against and pushed back. Um, they were they were bullied, they were targeted or targets of violence. And um, those the Chinese at this particular time weren't necessarily immigrating to the United States. They were just coming like everybody else was to see if they could find gold and then go back home. So I think that's interesting. We kind of forget about that too. Um, that's just an image. The way they go to California, it shows a bunch of different things. They show uh, air which was really not a possibility yet. Um, they show balloons. They show this kind of, it looks like it's a, a water ski in the air. Anyway, this is an example of that kind of stereotypical um, Chinese discrimination like we were talking about. Um, Chinese men were required by national law to wear uh, their cue, the long braid as a sign of loyalty. And so miners um, who were fighting in the gold rush would sometimes chop those off as a form of disrespect to the Chinese who were here. And um, when they returned to China without it, they could be put to death. So it was a serious offense. Okay, and this is just an image of San Francisco a few months before San Francisco became part of a new state called California. Anyway, that wraps up our notes. We've gone through a lot here. If you have any questions, don't hesitate to let me know.